Good? All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kyle Andrus, and we'll talk a little bit about evil, a little bit of hunting. Uh, just quick disclaimer, of course, opinions expressed in the presentation are just my own. Please don't sue me, company. <laughs> uh, in general, I've been working in IT for about 10 years. Uh, last two years or so, I've been working strictly in uh, security, in particular forensics. So a lot of the work that I do is uh, chasing down why something executed or looking into a malicious document attachment and then just kind of pulling out what's in there and trying to find either some indicators or usually just IP addresses to see if it's going to any of our other machines. Um, I really like weird computer problems. That's how I got started. Uh, I'd start off in the company basically as a third level support person. So I dealt with a lot of weird problems, weird software. Uh, software that people either wrote and then disappeared, either the company or the person that wrote it. So you're the person that has to try and go back and reverse engineer what they did. So I've always been like really interested in when things break, which basically led me into forensics and why I basically like it so much. Um, because it gets back to the roots of trying to figure out exactly why something executed or why something ran and why something just happened. Uh, which basically leads you to a lot of spreadsheets. Uh, <laughs> Fortunately, in forensics, you tend to make a lot of timeline analysis as you're uh, getting artifacts and parsing them and looking for, you know, to put every, all the events in an order. It usually gets put into a spreadsheet and you just stare at it for days. So, so our agenda, just going to look over a little bit when something crashes, kind of what you think about. Um, disk in memory. Artifacts of interest. A little bit of process shenanigans. Uh, malware persistence and tools to help find evil. So usually, uh, we're talking about something terrible happens. You're the browsing and something crashes, or if you're at like a corporation, you have a virus alert that goes off, or a firewall alert, or you get a report from a user that says something bad happened, or you leave your computer unlocked and your coworkers take care of the rest, like that guy. <laughs> uh, so, and every time that happens, you know, you usually have a little tick in the back of your head that's like, was that malware? Was that not malware? What? What just happened? And in the end, you, you start to record everything that you know. So you'll grab any process, uh, any process that you know the names of, especially the time date is probably the most important piece because you're going to use that later to narrow down your search when you're combing through all this evidence. So, first let's just kind of acquire all the things. Um, so we'll talk about disk and memory acquisition. Um, how many people here actually have acquired disk and memory? Okay. So there's, there's a bunch of tools and some ideas kind of behind it. So first, if we're talking about disk, you can kind of think of a full disk or a targeted or sniper. And the idea is if normally during an investigation, you might grab a hard drive, you plug it in, and you image the entire drive. Uh, it takes a lot of time. Usually, if you're dealing with malware or something that likes, you kind of want to get a fast answer. And so you're going to target just um, forensic artifacts that you know are going to give you a big bang for your buck. So you might grab the, on the NTFS file system, you might grab the NFT file. And then you might grab uh, the hypersys file. And then you might grab event logs and kind of go down that path. And that would be kind of like more of a sniper forensics. And there's an art, there's actually a whole article written by Chris Prog that talks about that. Um, but if you are taking like a full disk image, one thing to keep in mind is that you probably need to use a write blocker. Because as soon as you plug that drive into your computer, if you have any antivirus or other software, it'll start writing or reading to it. And that'll just kind of mess up your evidence. So with a write blocker, it's a physical device that you plug in between your computer and the hard drive, and it prevents your computer from doing any writes to it. Um, raids, if you ever have to image a raid for some reason, that would be terrible because they're probably gigantic and would take forever. But usually you use a logical because if you try to grab physical drives one by one, you're not going to be able to put all that back together. And if you do, you probably have specialized expensive software. Uh, encryption can be a problem too, and it can slow down your investigation or when you're acquiring. Like you can acquire it very easily, but when you go to use your forensics tools and grab different pieces of it, you're not going to be able to read it because the data is encrypted. So then you have to take the extra step of actually going through and decrypting it. 
There's some tools out there that'll help you with this. Uh, NCase, for example, actually allows you to decrypt McAfee. So you actually give the decrypt key to NCase, and as it processes that data, it'll actually decrypt it first and then go through. So in doing disk acquisition, there's some a couple of tools I, I've just run across that I've used. And there's a lot out there in general. Uh, FTK Imager, in my opinion, like it's a very simple tool, and it has a lot of uses, especially either at work or at home. Uh, there's the Linux variety of DD, which got ported over to Windows as well, so you have like a Windows DD. And then there's a couple of uh, free pieces out there. Uh, FResponse will actually, you'll uh, deploy out a client to an endpoint, and you'll have an iSCSI connection created back. So it kind of looks like a local disk on your machine. And then you can use something like FTK Image or another copier, and you can actually make a, a disk image. It'll create a lot of network traffic, though. Uh, and then FTK and NCase also can acquire disk. So let's just look real quick at like FTK Imager and show you what that looks like real quick. Let's see how smoothly this goes. Got music too. Unless of course I close that. Nope, there it is. Oh, of course. It's not going to do that. Nope. One second. This is going to be painful. So this is FTK Imager. And what's kind of nice about it is if you wanted to, you can mount your own uh, hard drive or image. And when you do that, doo -doo -doo -doo, so I can select here. I don't know if you guys can see that. So for example, I have my 500 gigabyte SSD drive. I'll select that one. And when I mount it, I'll actually see it at a pretty low level. So I can open up my partition. Whoops, not unallocated. We don't want that. Go to the root of the drive. And then from here, like if we were doing like a Sniper Forensics type, we would actually use this tool after mounting the drive. And we could just like, for example, acquire the MFT file that's right here. And I could just export that file to a location that I want. Or if I was on a live system, you could pop it open. You could create a disk image. And you could select it like so. Again, selecting that image, the drive you want, and then your dim image destination. So you can kind of choose different uh, formats. Most times you're just going to use RAW. Uh, you'll use RAW because a lot of the tools out there can deal with RAW very easily. Uh, another common one that you'll see is this guy, EO01, which is used by NCase. It actually does a lot more metadata and also does compression, so your images are a little smaller, but other tools sometimes don't know how to deal with that. So if you're using like open source tools, they might break. And then basically that's it. You can also add in a little metadata to the image which you can add case numbers, yada, yada. I usually don't. Just take the image and go. Taking a, a full SSD drive can take a couple of hours. Yeah, this would be annoying. Of course not. There we go. All right, and then when you get over to memory acquisition, you kind of have another idea where you can either, well, usually you're just going to take a full memory dump, um, which usually isn't a problem, but what's happening, of course, is memory emit, or the amount of memory you have on your system is getting bigger and bigger. So before, like, four gigs of memory to pull is a piece of cake. You go to eight, not so bad. 16, getting a little rough. You're doing 64, 128, 128, starts to become a problem. So another option that you can have when you're pulling memory is you can do live analysis. So you can have a client on the endpoint. Um, and so GUR, for example, is Google's rapid response, which you actually deploy out to all your endpoints. And you can actually query across all of them. It's a pretty useful tool, open source and free. And it's also tied in with uh, uh, Recall, which is a, another memory analysis tool that was split off of volatility. You can also use a uh, Redline Collector. Uh, Redline is a tool made by Mandiant. It very easily, you can 
parse and then have it analyze your memory image and kind of give you some results real quick back. But you can also make a redline collector, which is pretty interesting because you can collect from the machine not only the memory artifacts that you want, but you could also do disk. And so with memory acquisition, there's a lot of tools out there as well. Dump it being one of them. FTK Imager, again, we can actually use the same one to take it. Uh, Mandian's red line using a collector. And volatility and recall can both use them as well. Uh, WinPmem is a very common tool too, written by Michael Cohen. So you have a lot of options in your arsenal. One problem with like dump it though, it's a very common one, but you can't use it in like scripting because it actually asks for a prompt after you run it. It's a very simplistic tool. Once you run it, it basically just dumps the memory image in the same directory. But it's going to expect you to run it and then click yes. So I'll take a little look at those tools after I have to do my shenanigans. So jump back to... It's actually hard to see in this thing. There we go. So my FTK imager, you can easily just do file and capture memory. And then dump it. See, pretty simple. You just click yes and it starts to acquire. Um, usually acquiring memory is pretty quick too. It only takes a couple of minutes. And then with red line, scary things. If you go into Redline when you open it, you can see at this top these collectors that you can make. So if we go into one of these, let's just do a standard. So first off the bat, you can just click uh, this option, which will basically acquire a full memory image and do some analysis, or also grab some other artifacts. But if you actually click the edit script, you're going to have a whole bunch of options that you can go after. Um, by default, the strings is always going to be left unchecked. So it's a good thing to grab, but it will slow down when you do acquisition. But it's pretty useful after the fact. And then you'd also see in the same collector, we can do disk, system, network, and a few other things. So we could add these if we wanted to into our collector. I already got one of these made and kind of what it looks like. So when you get done, you basically get this directory of scripts here. And all you have to do is run the red line audit bat. And then it'll kick off and do everything that you put in the collector. So pretty useful if you just want to hand somebody a thumb drive and tell them to plug it into the machine, run the script, and you're going to acquire everything that you need to do your investigation or start hunting around. And then when we talk about remote tools, um, commonly when you're in infrastructure, infrastructure, I'm sorry, a corporation, your assets are going to be scattered all over the place. You're probably not going to have physical access to go to it and get it. So one poor man's tool you can use is PSExec in a Windows share. Uh, anybody here familiar with PSExec? Yeah. Really useful tool. Uh, allow you to basically either run a remote command on a Windows box or you could log into it with like a command shell. And so one option you can do is using admin uh, prompt on your system, you can run psexec and then, oh, I'm sorry, first you want to do xcopy so you could copy over script to the machine. Then you could run psexec for like the redline collector. It'll collect memory and everything else that you need and then you can xcopy it off of there. You are going to make a little bit of noise on the host machine, but for you, it's going to be worth it because at least you get instantly a copy of memory that you can start working with. You can also use DD and Netcat. They've both been ported to Windows. So if you're more familiar with that, you can do that as well. Uh, and then if you have bags of money, you can go with FResponse, which is you can also acquire memory. And it's actually kind of neat because when you connect to a machine with an FResponse agent on it, um, when you connect to the, the memory on it, it'll actually map to your computer and you'll have a little like you go to the G drive 
pop it open, and right there is your memory file. You just copy paste it to your machine. Makes it really easy to use. Also, the nice thing about FResponse is it's got a giant API that you can run around with. So you can automate a lot of your collection. And then GUR Rapid Response as well. You can actually, either if you're going to do memory analysis or if you're just going to pull a copy of memory, you can do that with that tool. So we got an image. Boo! So let's kind of play around with it and see what we can get. So when we're kind of hunting around for evil or some indications of something that's not good, um, we'll look at a couple artifacts of interest, some process shenanigans, and yada yada. <laughs> so the first one that we can kind of look at is going to be user assist. Um, user assist is going to be within the context of the user that was logged in at the time. And what's nice about it is Windows keeps track of all the programs that you run and how many times you ran it. It does this so that it can populate things like frequently used applications or your start. You know, we click start and it shows you all the apps that you run. It's doing that out of this registry hive where it's keeping that. So if a program is executed from the user's context, then it'll be recorded there. Uh, it's actually in ROT 13 encoded, so you can't just open up register like regedit and take a look at it. But it'll give you the name of the application, the runtime, and the number of times executed. So kind of looking here, on the top you see just the registry, and you can see it kind of looks like gobbledygook in the red. And then Nursoft has a tool called User Assist View, which you can jump into, and it'll show you kind of, for example, the command prompt was run three times, or PowerShell was run seven times. And if you're working in an environment where most of your users don't use PowerShell or the command prompt, that could be an indication of that's a little weird. You might want to actually jump in there and get a copy of memory and then dump out maybe what was being run at the time. Another good one is the app cat or app compat cache. Another registry hive. Uh, this one is for the application compatibility shim cache, uh, stored in the Windows registry, of course. Uh, you'll have it for uh, in the system. Excuse me. Uh, it's going to contain you know your last execution time, full path, file name. Uh, one bad thing about it is is that it doesn't write to disk until a full shutdown. But it's another place where you're going to have at least one execution on, uh, every time you run something because Windows is going to see if it needs to apply any shims to an application. So each time it's run, it's added into this registry hive. So you at least get one piece. And you can parse that out using the shim cache plugin via Redripper. So you can see, here's like Python, for example, is run and Snagit. Anybody know what Snagit is? How many documents have you made? <laughs> Too many? Yeah. Uh, another spot that's out there as part of the Microsoft uh, Application Experience and Compatibility Service is the Recents File Cache, and in Windows 8 it got changed to the AM Cache. Um, these two are also now like, if it, if these, since these reside on disk, they're useful to snag um, if you're doing like sniper forensics. And the reason why is it's a temporary spot for as a process is being created. So kind of like the App Compatibility Cache, It'll briefly touch down and it'll have information as to, you know, what was run, uh, the modified times of that file. And what's really interesting is in the AM cache, which is recent to Windows 8, you actually get a SHA-1 hash. Um, these are temporary and they tend to be run, uh, well, they're, they're in there for a couple of weeks for sure. I remember the exact number. Wow. But, there are some parsers out there for it. Uh, the first one, actually, uh, Harlan Carver has rfc.exe, which can parse it out for Windows 7 boxes, the recent file cache. And then Yogesh actually has a lot of uh, research about this topic and some talks online. Uh, he blows it away and does some amazing things with it. But it's another location to look for uh, applications that ran. So when something crashes on your system or something's going on, you're going, to try, you're going to want to try and find any executables that ran at the time. Of course, prefetch is very common. Uh, it originally is used to speed up application launching when you start up the machine. Uh, 
One bad thing is on Windows 7, for example, it's automatically disabled by default. But it will show you like the last execution time and the name of the executable and path. Uh, with Windows 8, actually, it is re-enabled. So kind of an example of that, if you go into the C Windows prefetch directory, you can see all the uh, prefetch files here that you can parse out and get the, ex like the execution information, or the time, I should say, sorry. And another spot that's overlooked commonly, if you have a, a critical machine or server somewhere, you probably have the option, depending on how much space you have on your machine or how many logs you want to keep, the audit process creation and termination. Um, by default, this is turned off in Windows. But if you do turn it on, it will show you every time that a process is created and terminated. And just to give you an idea, uh, you can go into your local group policy editor. If you go into uh, Windows settings, security settings, advanced audit policy configuration, and within the system audit policies, you can enable these. So the good thing is you can see process creation. The bad thing is you see a ton of process creation and termination. So this can very easily fill up um, your log source. So if you have a SIM, for example, and you have entire infrastructure running all of this on your workstations, your SIM is going to cry. Because <laughs> if you see the timestamps right there, this was just for a second, and you've got it happening within a minute multiple. But it can be useful because now we caught that Shady Panda Ultra 3 was executed. So let's look into process shenanigans. So one of the most common ways malware might hide on a system is actually just by hiding in plain sight. Um, so this is when you really need to know like your Windows environment and what applications should be running, what processes should be running, um, what parent process should be of what. Uh, common is going to be a misspelling. The LSS process is then misspelled as last.exe. But you might miss it when you're going through an output. And then, you know, having the same process name, but it's actually in a different directory. So it's launching out of the program32 directory instead of it being somewhere else where it should be. And then, of course, the an easy one to spot is whenever you see applications running out of a user's Internet Explorer temp directory. So, so let's look real quick at uh, an example. So Stuxnet is a very common memory example that's free on the internet. And the LSAS process on there actually gets duplicated. It actually uses a little bit of uh, hollowing to get it to work. But the and LSAS process is your local security authentication subsystem. And it's responsible for like forcing security policies on the system. And it should be started by the win and init process. So you should only see one LSAS process on a Windows box. Awesome, it's like messed up. And I'm working right now out of the SIF workstation, which has a variety of tools, uh, especially for forensics. So for, oh man, that's going to suck. Gosh damn. Live demo fail. Yeah, so that's going to be ugly. Cool. So what we're going to use is we're going to use volatility, and we're going to use PS3. So we're looking at the memory image, and the first thing that we're going to do here, uh, after running it, we look at it and try and spot some things that are evil. Okay. It's kind of hard to read in this output, but... We already know that if we look for the LSAS process, we're going to see that there's three executions of it. 
And if we look at this, we can notice that on the left here, like on, oh, I can actually highlight. So this is going to be the actual uh, process PID, and this is going to be the parent ID that launched it. So we have an LSAS process that was being executed by one parent and another one being processed by another. So if we take a look at this, so we can see that process 624 is actually the win login. Whoops, I, I said win, didn't I? My correction for win login. And out of that, we can see that the LSS process that's legitimate was launched by that parent. What about the other ones? Those ones were launched by something else. So I'm looking at this output. We can see that it was launched by the services.exe. So services.exe, for some reason, is now launching LSAS. It's not a good indication. So one, we would probably pull these processes out of memory using volatility like proc dump. And we can submit those for further analysis to confirm if they're evil. Nope. All right, I'll stop fiddling here. Doing like a PowerPoint slide shuffle. Uh, another thing that can happen is, of course, hooking. Uh, hooking isn't evil by its nature, but it can be used for hooking, or it can be used for evil. Um, a lot of the times when you're using like a, a Windows debugger, it's going to hook into uh, certain function calls, messages, and events within the operating system. Uh, but so do key loggers and rootkits like to do the same thing. And so using volatility, if you have a memory image, you can actually go through using like the API hooks, event hooks, and message hooks. And you can parse through them looking for things that might be abnormal. Um, and then you can dig deeper into the processes that, for example, are calling those. Injection is a very common one as well. Uh, and injection is a little more easier to find uh, when you're hunting. For using the volatility plugin, you can actually use Malfine that'll go through and find injected pieces of code. And Malfine, the way that it works is it searches through memory looking for executable code um, that's not backed by a file. So usually when you have a process that launches and libraries that are loaded, those libraries are going to be backed to disk somewhere. When you don't have that, that's not, not always bad, but it can be an indication of bad. And it also will be marked as execute, and it's not going to be all zeros. Shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. So if we run malfind using volatility, so in this one, this one actually should, oh, it probably have it from the right directory. Be a little easier to read. So malfind is identifying those properties I talked about. Uh, where either it's not mapped to disk, um, it's marked as executable and not all zeros. And so there's a lot of processes in here. And if you're familiar with the Zeus virus, it actually injects itself into a variety, uh, like a ton of legitimate processes. So we're going to look at uh, ALG, for example. And if you use uh, Malfine, you can actually dump all the sections of memory that it finds to be potentially evil. And so if we go into that directory, This dump, for example, which we identified, on. no, 
again. Wrong directory. So we identified two sections of memory. The first one we know right off the bat is more than likely or worth our attention because there's an MZ header, which is usually a portable execution. So if we uh, pull this out of memory, we can actually put that up to like a like a malware analyzer. A very common one, for example, is like virus total. So if you upload to virus total, it'll do a dynamic analysis of the code you submitted. It'll also look for any antivirus hits. So when I uploaded this section of memory, it actually, actually this one, it actually got hit with 37 out of 52 antiviruses picked it up. So definitely evil. And then to get a little more detailed, because that's just the this process section, you can also go into relationships and we can find other hashes that this hash was also seen with it after it was. And so we can see here that it was Zeus.zip. So we now we have an indication that Zeus is on that system. And then process hollowing, which is what we actually see in Stuxnet, is when you launch a actually legitimate process and then you put it in a suspended state so the malicious process will actually take out um, code out of that uh, normally uh, healthy process and it's going to insert its own malicious code. Uh, this, this is an easy one to find because you're going to find that there's no files back to disk on it. But normally, if you're looking through normal tools, the process is going to look legitimate. Like, it'll be signed and it looks all happy. But it's not. So, a little bit of malware persistence. I mean, once a malware is on a system, it has to be in certain locations for it to keep running. I mean, you hear about malware that's only memory only. That's great, but if you do reboot the machine, that malware is going to be gone unless there's another command and control server on the network that's going to reinfect it when it's done rebooting. If not, then you have to place in a location where it's going to start. A common one, of course, is the auto runs locations. It's going to be your common file and registry locations to start a program at boot. And if you're a sysadmin, you're very familiar with these. And with sys internal tools, if you're on an actual live box, you can run auto runs and you can actually see those. Or if you have a copy of memory, you can pull out all the locations that were loaded into memory. So it'll pull um, registry and the file and a few other locations. So, for example, this is using the system internals auto runs tool. And you can see the registry entries and also the file location for some common startups. This one looks all okay. And then, of course, malware hiding services. Uh, using the same tool, uh, you can actually hunt for the same thing. The volatility auto runs plugin will pull this as well. And if you're using auto runs, this internals tool, it'll actually show you everything that's running as well. Oh, wait, hi. So that was the service scan and, and volatility that'll actually pull us back. Of course, scheduled tasks, uh, it's a common way to Continuously run a program in Windows. It's another location. Volatility auto runs will also pick it up. And it's also picked up in this internal tool. WMI is one that's a little more scarier. Uh, if you've seen the talk by William Matt and Claudio, Claudio, uh, it's a great talk that they gave at DEF CON and Derby CON. Uh, and really the, the idea is that you're going to create your own class in WMI. And if you're not familiar with WMI, it's a great management tool. Uh, you can query system information. You get computer uh, networking information and other tools. And applications can easily add their own classes to do that. A great example would be Dell, for example. They have a provider that you can add that adds their classes. And then using that WMI provider, you can actually change, for example, uh, bio settings. And so one location is when you create a, an MOF file or a managed object file, you're going to have an event filter, which essentially is kind of like what's going to trigger this. 
So that could be time, that could be a listener for some other event to happen, clicking a key. And then the event consumer is going to be the piece that actually has the payload in it. Usually it's uh, VBScript or PowerShell. They're usually also obfuscated, so they're hard to just scan around to try and find them easily. And then the filter to consumers binder basically just puts the two together. And so once that's added, if the system's rebooted or if they restart the WMI or WMI, then that malware is going to execute every time. And one way to look for it is if you go into WMI and root subscription. And so here's Windows WMI uh, viewer tool. And in this example, I would search for the root subscription. And I actually only have one legitimate event here. But if you see other ones that were not, they're worth the time of research and would potentially lead you to the malware. And then DLL hijacking uh, is like the art of loading malicious libraries into an application. Uh, there's a lot of ways that this can be done. Uh, but the first thing it's going to do when you launch a process, for example, it's going to check in memory to see if a DLL is already there. If it's not there, then it might look in the known DLLs list. And then it's going to start looking in its own app directory. So if you're in C program files, cool app 2, and you run it from there, if you put a DLL in there that that application loads, it will potentially, if it's written poorly, it'll potentially load that DLL from that directory instead of somewhere else where it may be loaded on the system. So another thing you can look for is looking for rogue DLLs in weird directories. So some tools to kind of help automate your job and look around for malware. Uh, probably the neatest tool to grab out there is log to timeline. If you take a full disk image, it'll actually parse using all the artifacts that you can think of. And well, that actually is a couple more. But it'll put them all into a nice timeline for you. You can export that as like a CSV, and then you can add that into Excel, for example. You have to be careful, though, because if you do a full disk, then you're going to have probably a million to two million lines in your CSV file. If you're running Excel 32-bit, you're probably going to run out of the or you'll run out of memory to actually store all of that, and so it won't be able to completely load the file. So you definitely have to get at least Excel 64-bit. Um, it it is really a, a neat thing to watch. I use this a lot when we're trying to hunt down if a user did something and then the actions after that, because for example, if they clicked on a bad link, so they open up Outlook, you'll see Outlook being opened up in the timeline, and then if they clicked a document, you'd actually see the document either hit disk, or if it was launched, you'll see it in the parameter. Then you can see it just, as you're going through the timeline, the disk for, from the MFT file that was parsed will show you where different pieces of malware may have dropped. So it gives you just it's kind of nice. So, for example, on this one, we're actually showing deleted registry entries, the user assist key. It also parsed out the flash cookies and McAfee AV logs. So it's a really cool tool to play with. Bulk extractor is another one. It's very fast and quick to use. Uh, one of the things that makes it fast is that it's multi-coreware, so if you have more cores on your system, it'll parse an image file faster. But it'll scan looking for uh, URLs, IPs, domains, credit cards, zip files. The neatest thing it does is histograms. Like if you're looking for IPs, this would be a great place because you can see in the histogram there's only like one going to here. You're going to see a whole bunch going of hits for usually the host IP. And then usually if it's in like a domain, you just see domain controller IPs and everything else. Other useful like artifacts or information to get out of here is the domain histogram. So I'll show you all the domains, like the most uh, commonly hit ones. Uh, and also URL. You can actually pull out Facebook conversation out of this too. It's, it's got a ton of plugins. Uh, another useful piece is that it'll actually pull out network packets and it'll build a PCAP. So you can open up the PCAP file and do analysis there, in, like in Wireshark. Volatility, I've, I've probably said it 20 times. It's a free tool. 
um, from the Volatility Foundation. Uh, they're constantly adding new plugins, new parsers for as the uh, operating system is advanced. Windows 10 has already got some functionality. Incredible. Uh, probably the most used pieces of it is when I'm dumping like a DLL out. There's a plugin for called dump or DLL dump. There's one for like proc dump, uh, dump files. It's really useful, especially if you're searching for like a, a file that was ex or like a something that was opened that might still be in memory, but they deleted it off disk. You could actually do a file scan using volatility, and then you could remove or you could export or dump that file out to disk and analyze it. The SIFT workstation, uh, extremely powerful. It's basically like the Kali Linux of the blue team world. It's just jam-packed with every tool that you can think of to parse almost anything. A lot of standalone parsers and also tools like uh, log to timeline and bulk extractor. And then malware.com and VirusTotal are common uh, malware analysis services if you don't have something in-house. If you're a larger corporation, you might be using Wildfire. And now they have a new product called Autofocus, which is kind of neat because Wildfire will do your uh, dynamic analysis of any executables you send. So if you're trying to check, is this evil, you'll send it over. It'll do the analysis and come back. But it also has a piece called Autofocus, which is kind of like Palo Alto is selling back all the customers' data that they're sending to Wildfire, and then you pay a subscription of like 30000 or some ridiculous amount of money to get access to it. But the really neat part is that it'll do analysis across the board. So if you're in like a utility industry, then it'll show you all the other utilities and things that are hitting their network. And so, and they'll relate it like, oh, you got, you saw this malware that you sent to us. That's actually a part of this campaign that's going on and hitting this industry. So it's a really cool tool to use. Um, and FireEye from Mandiant also does similar functionality. One thing I like about malware.com is it gives you, uh, a, it gives you a, a nice view and it actually gives like screenshots of the malware. So it'll have a sandbox for XP and, and Windows 7. So when it runs the malware, if anything pops up, it'll show it to you. And then IOCs, uh, indications of compromise. If you find something that is evil and you can confirm it, you can actually use Mandian's open IOC framework. Uh, it's basically kind of like XML, and you can define exactly how to find this file again. So if it's uh, MD5 hashes that you're looking for, the name of a uh, bad executable, um, or other indications of it, like it loads these DLLs, you can actually write that into a format and can use it to be scanned. So once you create an IOC, you can use something like Redline or Volatility to scan your environment. Also, bigger tools and corporations will use it as well. And that's it. Uh, another announcement to make, uh, Convergent B-Sides is a conference in Detroit that's coming up. It should be July... Can't remember, I'm helping run it. Uh, 14th, 15th, and 16th. Uh, it's a pretty fun conference. It's kind of, we're trying to make it like a blue-centric. So more of the defense analysis, but bringing in both sides. Uh, this guy over here by that yellow balloon. That's right. Yep. Uh, it's, it's a great conference. If you're interested in volunteering, let me know. We always need people to help. And we have people that do either our capture the flag program or helping with speakers. And that's all I got. Thank you.